pretty excited by the opportunity to have the conversation that we're going to have over the next hour um, with a panel as eminent as this and an audience that is as eminent as this. Um, because it's a pretty important conversation. The discussion on innovation um, has been resonating around the community. Um, it's been on a lot of lips. It's not hard to fill an auditorium like this one with people on the conversation. But we've gone through the hype cycle. We've gone through the period when we can afford to have a loose conversation about in innovation is important. And we're at an absolutely criti critical juncture where we have to make it count. Um, we were just talking at our table about we probably only have literally a matter of months left as a business community to actually make this, uh, this really count. When we look at innovation and industry, I looked at a number of, in pre preparing some questions and discussion points, um, I looked at a number of um, industry reports and I picked on um, a particular report that Deloitte, that we did very recently, um, Innovation in Mining. We will send the link out after this to everybody. Um, the reason why I picked on that was that when you look at areas of Australia's natural advantage, you see an opportunity for Australia to particularly play. Now when we look at that, when we look at the mining and mining services industry, we see some trends which seem to repeat themselves pretty consistently across the core areas of Australia's economy. We found that Australian companies are very willing to innovate. Um, no, um, no lack of enthusiasm. When we look at, uh, Glynis took us through some of the stats on how many companies are innovating. When we go behind those and we look at um, why, why isn't innovation completely prevalent, and indeed where it is prevalent, why isn't it um, even more effective uh, than, it, than it is? We find there are a number of obstacles. Those obstacles are particularly, there are, there are two key obstacles. The first key obstacle that uh, comes up over and over again in interviews and in research studies is the ability to collaborate across boundaries. So we see effective ecosystems within organisations for um, innovation um, being established. What we see is a weaker ability to collaborate across organisational boundaries, and Glenn has touched on the ability to collaborate between, um, uh, between industry and academia um, and opportunities there. Uh, we also see that there's a tendency to weight our innovation. So in the case of mining, what we see is when we look at um, innovation, innovative in investment in innovation, it's very heavily weighted towards the core. In fact, uh, nearly three quarters of innovation that occurs within uh, the mining sector um, is geared towards effectively increasing the productivity and optimization of core operations. Yeah, uh, only um, less, about 20% is actually geared towards adding to the adjacency, so finding adjacent opportunities for, uh, for innovation, and less than 10% um, is geared towards finding um, breakthrough opportunities, those, those brand new areas of, um, of innovation and opportunity for completely new revenue models. When surveyed, um, companies mining, and again this repeats itself in other industry sectors as well, um, companies express a desire to shift that um, quite significantly. They still though seem to want to have about half of their innovation geared towards the core, but then they want to break a, larger, a much larger component towards about a quarter um, heading up towards uh, the breakthrough opportunities and the balance into the, into the adjacencies. And so some of the key questions come, what, what will it take to do, to do that, and we're, we're going to sort of uh, discuss that with our panel in a moment. Um, innovation discussion, though, the reason why I say it's a bit of a ticking, um, it's got a ticking clock against it, is that it's been a discussion in the public mind uh, which has got somewhat confused. When we talk about innovation uh, more widely and we survey the wider Australian population, people see innovation as being something that is directly associated with making Sydney into Silicon Valley. It's tech, it's about tech. It's about uh, creating the next unicorn, putting a unicorn on Bondi. Um, and that can't be the conversation. Um, that doesn't play to the Australian core. So when you get to Geelong, you know, you look at jobs in Geelong in Victoria, or you look at Elizabeth in South Australia, or even if you look in far north Queensland or Western Sydney, you have to make innovation absolutely relevant. So when we look in this room about industry and innovation, we start to play to the areas of natural advantage to Australia, the, our ability to be able to do things that will, nat, that will uh, that we have a natural tailwind where we can innovate, invent world-leading solutions, 
take them out there and develop revenue into, within Australia, productivity within Australia, and export revenue. Now, we'll talk about some of, some of the obstacles, but I said that um, I talked about the ability to go across boundaries, the willingness of people to share innovation, the reasons why they are nervous about taking their own innovations and inventions and, um, and exposing them to others to find one plus one equals three. But we also find that there are some cultural issues as well. Um, our entire education system, and in fact in many ways our entire professional business progression, is geared around the idea of structure, the idea of uh, there, are a set, there are a set of outcomes that we want to achieve. The research is finding that the individuals within organisations who are most successful at innovation are actually moving beyond the, those standard structures. They're actually going back almost to their childhood. Um, I'm going to apply um, what I call the Pokemon test. Can I get a quick show of hands? How many people in this room have played Pokemon Go? Come on, be honest. Don't be embarrassed. So uh, the room split into three parts. About a third of the room and about half the panel, I think half the panel said yes. Um, about a third of the room said yes. About the third of the room shook your heads and said, I'm a serious business person, I don't play Pokemon Go. Um, the point there is, is Pokemon Go important? No, probably not. It's a, it, it's a game. But it's something that gained the public uh, imagination. When we talk about innovation, a number of industry, a number of companies have been looking very closely at virtual reality. And virtual reality didn't work in, the, in its first wave. Google Glass and technologies like that didn't take off. And then when we see something like Pokemon Go, that just gets massive explosion. We need a culture. If you want innovation to work, it turns out that the willingness of the people who are doing the innovation for you, um, who are leading innovation to play, is probably the most important attribute that we have. So having opened up with the importance of, um, of play, I'm going to now turn to the panel. And, and for a first question while I take a seat, um, Andrew, you're closest to me, so I'll start, um, I'll start with you. Can you um, suggest to me what, what is your industry going to look like in 10 years, and is Pokemon Go going to be important? <laughs> so, uh, seriously, uh, visualisation will be important. Um, but as far as what our industry is going to look like, and our, uh, so I work for, uh, for Shell, our industry is the energy um, industry. It's, uh, it's gas, it's oil, um, but... Uh, it's an industry that faces one of the biggest challenges, and, and to be honest, I think many of us in this room face this challenge around how are we going to respond to um, you know, the, the twin demands of population growth, that population moving up um, its, uh, its prosperity, and, and hence requiring more energy, and the challenge that comes with that of how do we do that in a sustainable way and, uh, and address the climate challenge. And that is the, is the biggest challenge that we will face over the next 10 years. And it's one where all the answers are not available yet. And uh, we're going to have to work with many people to find our way through the, uh, the, the dilemmas that we face. Um, so what will it mean? We know a few things for sure. It will, it will mean that we will be moving to a net zero emission world. We know that. We need to. Um, we know that uh, our business will need to change, but there's many aspects of it that we don't know. And uh, you know, the, the global energy system has something like $55 trillion invested in it. It's not a system that adapts easily. Uh, it's a huge challenge and we don't have all the answers. We know that we'll have to work with many people to find our way through that. Thanks, and Gladys, same question for you. Can you hear me? Yep. Just picking up on Andrew's comments, I'm in a couple of our growth centres, mining equipment, technology and services and energy, uh, oil and gas. I think um, technology is going to have a huge part to play, not in only the way how business is conducted, but more in the clean energy, how do we uh, meet those targets of increased population and a clean energy future. And I think. Uh, Australia is well placed to be at the forefront of some of those technologies, given our background as well. In terms of my industry, I, if I've got a public service industry, um, uh, hopefully it will be lean and mean, but also be absolutely customer responsive and be able to keep up with uh, 
customer and stakeholder needs in the future and be, have become much more agile, less hierarchical, uh, more willing to take risks as well. So I'm hoping that we can uh, work more in partnership with um, stakeholders in the future. Thank you. Now, just showing we're a well-oiled machine, I think that um, I assume we're going to do introductions up front, and I think we have introduced the panel, so I, so I apologise uh, for that. Glynis has already been introduced, but um, I should have said that um, Andrew Smith is the country chair for Shell Australia. Um, Andy Vesey is the um, managing director and chief executive officer of AGL, um, and, um, and Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff Colbert is the President and Chief Executive of GE Australia, New Zealand and PNG. So Andy, same, uh, same question to you from an AGL perspective. <coughs> and so now that you introduced me, I'm accountable for all my remarks. Right? <laughs> yeah, you know, let me talk about the way I see our company positioned and the question as to how the industry positions is, is, is different. Because if I do this right, they won't look anything like we look. Because you know, when we talk about innovation, innovation is a strategic response um, to competition. So if the best way to say how I think we'd look going forward in 10 years is to really look at what I want my customers to look like. And the customers of AGL, first of all, will make an affirmative choice to be customers of AGL. Uh, they will be making that decision on an informed basis, and they will constantly advocate for my brand. So how do you do that? Uh, well, that's one of the reasons why we just announced this $300 million digital transformation project, because our industry is ripe for digital disruption, and whether you want to call that innovation or not, the way we interact with our customers is critically, critically important. Um, I think when you think about our industry broadly now, uh, most of them and most elements of the energy business, whether that's gas or electric, uh, whether it's the generation, transportation, or the retailing of those products, came out of industries that were wholly regulated, if not government owned. And quite honestly, we've inherited a few aspects of that, of that, that um, history. And I think if you look at our business broadly, you find that um, we've based it on two very important things, at least on the retail side of the business. And I'm going to tell you a big dirty secret here, but it's not just about me. So you all have to promise that when you leave here, you're not going to be telling this to anybody. Okay, I think you said yes. <laughs> Our business is based on the retail side of this. <clears throat> Basically, we reward disloyalty because if I only talk to you about a good deal when you threaten to leave me, and if I want your business, I have to steal it from somebody else. The bulk of my customers that aren't disloyal never hear from me in fact, really don't want to hear from me and are totally uninformed about what's in their own best interest. That's the recipe for digital disruption. I have to fix that. I have to move and achieve what I just told you about what I need as customers. I need informed customers making an affirmative choice, always advocating for my brand. And that's the essence of what a, a digital transformation can do for you. When you think about my industry broadly, we have negative net promoter scores. That means there's no advocacy that this fundamentally the opposite. So we're ripe for disruption, and that's why talking about innovation is very timely for us. And this doesn't have anything to do with market reform or decarbonization, even if none of those other things even existed. The, the change in the fundamental technology that surrounds all our industries will lead to disruption if we're not adequately attentive to our customers. And that's where innovation should start and finish. And Jeff. So we're going through probably the biggest transformation in the 130-year history of the General Electric Company at the moment. We historically have been a manufacturer of large industrial hardware, aircraft engines, locomotives, power stations, big ticket diagnostic healthcare equipment like CT scanners and MRIs. And that's been our core business for, for 130 years. But we're rapidly becoming now a software company as much as we are a hardware company, it's all based around the industrial internet, the internet of things, whatever you want to call it, the fourth industrial revolution. And the way we look at it is that uh, it's going to dwarf the consumer internet. The consumer internet connected around about a billion people worldwide. By our estimate, there's going to be 50 billion machines connected by the year 2020, and it only grows from there. And it's all about driving increasing productivity for our customers. It's about 
developing software solutions that attach to your hardware that get more productivity out of the assets. So, you know, on, on our analysis, if you can increase productivity in the oil and gas industry by 1%, it's worth five to six billion dollars a year in cost savings for the oil and gas industry. One percent in the aviation industry is worth about two to three billion dollars a year for the aviation industry. And to put it into context and to give you an example, you put software and sensors all over your engines and you start to record what happens when an engine flies, say between Sydney and LA, and you build up a database of information, you can start to feed that back into the airline and give them really in outstanding intelligence about how to fly that aircraft at the most opt in the most optimal way to reduce wear and tear on the engine, to reduce fuel burn, uh, to increase efficiency, and this will will ultimately lead to significant savings for the airline. So that's the transformation that we're going through at the moment, and we've been doing it now for about five years. We've invested around about two billion dollars a year uh, over the last five years in digital applications. We've now got fifteen thousand software engineers in the company worldwide and that number is growing. And so we've gone from being a manufacturer of, a hard, of hardware to being both a hardware and software company. And anyone who was in this game, anyone who was in the business of uh, manufacturing hardware, if they're not a software company as well as being a hardware company, then they will be disrupted and their business is going to be compromised. Well, in fact, you've gone so far as to take out the and and describe yourself as a software company. We call ourselves a digital industrial company, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it reflects where we are. And now what's really interesting about it is that it is also driving just massive cultural change within the organisation and we're having to completely rethink the way that we go to market, the way that we train our people, the speed at which we operate. Uh, who our customers actually are, who our stakeholders are, who do we collaborate with. Everything's up for grabs at the moment. Now, in about fair warning, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to look for um, to do the second half as questions from the floor. So if you can be creating your questions. But if during this discussion you want to jump in, you've got a follow-on question, just wave your arms. Be aware I'm very short-sighted, so you need to wave really vocally or yell at Pokemon really loudly. Um, so, and... Andrew, a question, question to you. The, um, the Prelude um, floating LNG facility off uh, WA uh, will be world first and is a good example of innovation in action. Yeah, what have you learnt from that experience? Yeah, so uh, we're in the, in the process of constructing um, a, uh, the, the largest thing that has ever floated. So uh, Prelude is a floating LNG um, plant. It's 488 metres long. It displaces more water than six of the largest American aircraft carriers. Uh, it's, it's an amazing piece of, of technology. But un underpinning it as just some really simple ideas. And, and the first of the idea was you don't always have to bring gas to a facility, uh, which is the historical way of doing the, uh, the gas business. In, in this case, we bought the plant out to the field. The field's hundreds of kilometres off the coast. It's actually not, not a massive gas field. It's a field that would never have been economic to develop if it had had to be piped back to, uh, to the shore. So that was the first great idea, take the plant to the field. The second great idea was, and again historically, we build gas plants in Australia in very remote places. Places like, uh, like the Barrett Peninsula, like Barrow Island, A-class a nature reserve, um, you know, Gladstone would be unfair to call it that remote, but away from the, uh, the major centres. I mean, and hence you've got to take the labour there. Now, in the case of Prelude, we went the other way. We said, OK, let's not, let's not take the labour to the plant. These are expensive places to get people to, uh, to get equipment. Let's build it where the people are. So we built it in a shipyard in Korea. Um, and then we will, we will actually commission most of it while it's in Korea and bring it down to Australia. So th there's some really simple ideas that underpin this. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a few more that, uh, that we're still working on with it and we'll do uh, subsequent. So there's some great learnings that have come from it. And I guess that's just the way with any first of a kind. There's some things where you go, gee, that was a brilliant idea. And there's some things where you go, hmm, when I do it next time, I'll do it different. And, um, and so some of the areas that we'll, uh, we'll look at um, in the future is things like how, how do we increase the productivity? How do we take the ideas that will make this so successful and 
take them into other applications. It's really hard to get a, uh, that much equipment on board a, uh, uh, something that floats. So we've learned a lot about extreme modularization and the safety arrangements that you have to have for that. We will take those ideas and use them in other um, projects that we're doing. Probably, and some of those projects will have nothing to do with gas. Um, some of the, the, the ways of managing simultaneous construction, commissioning and operations that we do because it's all in, in one facility and we're building it as, as well as running it in one go. We will take some of those ideas into our next projects. Um, it's driving the development of even more technologies. Things like the use of autonomous vehicles for, for maintenance. Um, we're working on picking technologies out of uh, adjacent fields to oil and gas. Um, we have a, a, a venture in Boston, Shell Technology Works, that picks up um, technology from other industries, like the medical industry, um, and works out how do we adapt this to uh, using oil and gas. So it's just a great platform for driving innovation in our business. So just as a follow on to that, you've described a number of things there where you've been first. Uh, one of the common concerns that people have when they go first is that you put all the investment in, others are going to pick up those innovations and, um, and manage to monetize them in their own investments at a much lower cost. Are you, are you worried about others going second and being fast followers in anything? Um, so look, we, we've never given a budget for for uh, how much Prelude got, yeah, it's cost, and I appreciate there's media here today, so I won't be giving one today. Um, but let's just say it's a significant sum of money, uh, and uh, before somebody puts their hand in their wallet and tries to do it, they're going to want to really know what they're doing. So, you know, so, and some of the technology, we'd be very happy to share. So one of the things that we do together with the University of Western Australia, we work with the Centre of Offshore Structures there, which I guess nobody in the room will have ever heard of, this team, but they are one of the world's best teams in what they do. They get business from around the world on offshore anchoring systems and geotechnical studies. Uh, it's something that, that got developed in Australia because of some of the, uh, the early experiences with the Northwest Shelf uh, Project. And if you want to know things like how pipelines move on the seafloor, these are some of the best people in the world to go to. And it's a great e example of collaboration that happens in Australia. It's a, a tremendous team of people that's been built up over many years with support from, uh, from uh, both the state and the federal government. But it, I think it also gives us a clue around innovation that a lot of what happens is very invisible. And we sometimes beat ourselves up about not being that innovative. But there are some tremendous examples around Australia of uh, things that we do really well. I'd say particularly in the resource industry uh, and the, uh, the challenge is to work out how to uh, get the multiplier effect going. We've seen the, uh, the government uh, really get behind the growth centres now with the six growth centres that uh, Glennis mentioned. It's great to have some stability in that sort of ecosystem because to be honest it has seemed to be used as a bit of a political football over the last couple of years. We need to just let that get going because through collaboration we've got some great um, great research institute, great academics, great students, um, and we need to be able to build that out to provide more employment opportunities in Australia. Can, can, can I get uh, other panellists to comment on that and just add into the collaboration one of the surveys of Australian business show that compared to North America and Europe, we have amongst the lowest rate of uh, creating patents. Um, so just building on the collaboration uh, comment and willingness to share innovation and fear of loss, um, what, what, what do you observe and what do you think the opportunities are? Well, as I said before, we've, we've totally changed our view on this over the last probably, probably decade. Uh, we, we are now, as an organisation, much more open to the notion of collaboration. We've come to the realisation that we have 300,000 employees in our company globally, but we don't have all of the answers. And why would we limit ourselves to the 300,000 employees who work for GE when there is a wealth of knowledge and capability and experience out there. We run innovation challenges. We, we, we ran an innovation challenge where we were trying to design a better bracket for the, uh, our, that, that fixes our engine to the wing of an aircraft. And it was won by some guy in central Java uh, who had an internet connection and knew something about this. And he designed a new bracket and he, you know, he won, I think, ten fifteen thousand dollars 15000 that is now in operation and that's a great example of how collaboration with the external community 
can really drive better ideas and, and better outcomes. We've just set up a, a, uh, a building in, in Redfern in Sydney that's wedged between the University of Sydney and Data61 and we're going to be inviting university students to come in and work on actual problems that we're trying to solve and the students are going to get course credits for their course at university for doing that. And, you know, I don't know whether this thing is going to work or not. I kind of did it as an experiment. It's kind of black ops and we'll see. But this is the kind of thing I think business can do. I think we can just try stuff. I think we can just uh, take a chance on some things. And that's what's going to drive this collaboration culture that you talk about. Waiting for someone else to do it. I I'm, I'm, I'm a really big seller of this notion of being a fast follower. Why wouldn't you want to lead, right? We need to be bold, we need to be brave, we need to be courageous. Australia needs to be bold, brave and courageous. We need to be, we're in a dogfight against uh, 7 billion people worldwide. There are 180 countries that want what we've got. And we have to take the view that we're going to be leaders. We're going to export great ideas around the world and we are going to punch above our weight as a country because we've only got 25 million people. So we've got to be bold, we've got to be courageous and we can't be thinking that being a fast follower is a good strategy. Glenis, I think that plays uh, very much to the comment you were making before about um, yeah, the evidence, uh, the, the metrics around those companies that innovate and those that, uh, those that don't. And, and that also applies to collaboration, not just with each other, but I guess between industry and the public funded research agencies. And you look at some great examples that CSIRO have done, and I know there's some CSIRO people in the audience today around the titanium heel and what they're doing in agriculture and the like. There's absolutely great opportunities there. And I guess from a public or from a government point of view, what do we need to do to incentivise the innovation that's happening? Obviously, get out of the way, but create the macro settings around tax, industrial relations, and then look at business capability around skills. Um, what is it um, that we do need to, to do to facilitate an operating environment that incentivises innovation. And uh, in earlier, earlier on this year, there was a review done of the R&D tax incentive, probably everyone in the room knows about that. Uh, one of the focus, of, uh, an area of, ki of key focus was efficiency along with um, integrity and additionality. So we've picked up the efficiency and we're running a biz lab. And this is very new for the government sector. So design thinking, getting uh, getting users of the R&D tax system, getting the tax accountants to come in, getting the tax office, us all together, trying to say, well, how does this system work? What are the barriers? How do we make it more efficient uh, for users? So in a sense, we were very good as a public service sitting back and doing desktop reviews and coming up with the perfect public policy. But I think now with design thinking and labs and uh, co-production, I think that's the way of the future for us. And, and how do people access the BizLab? Um, we've got a number of projects that we're um, operating on and uh, across the whole portfolio. So R&D tax incentives, one, the way we do performance management in the, in the department, I think uh, it touches about 20 people for one person who's being performance managed. And we did this diagram and it was, it's absolutely appalling. Uh, not a great exemplar of the public sector and bureaucracy. So even internally, we're looking at some of our business processes uh, to uh, get rid of uh, some of those um, impediments to doing business a lot faster. In terms of accessing BizLab, um, we're trying to create an environment uh, where we can hear from customers and stakeholders on what we can do to make a difference collectively. So it's not a a fixed program. Right. I know Andy's jumping in. Well, I <coughs> don't know if I'm jumping in. I'm, I'm sort of just wandering in. Um, <laughs> it, I just wanted to get some of this. You know, we, we talked about, uh, you saw with patents and, you know, and intellectual property. And I think that's a vital part. Ownership and being able to capitalize is, is good. And, you know, General Electric's not going to share its IP in an open market. It's going to capitalize on that. I, I think being first is okay because just being first doesn't give everybody the ability to follow. And I think the point that I want to make is that we're, we're tending to talk about innovation as invention. And innovation is not only invention. It's just knowing and improving every day and, and, and continuous improvement and innovating even on the smallest things. I think that, you know, one of the points, and, I, and, and Jeff mentioned it, uh, and I want to sort of go back to it, it's the question of culture. Because I think it all starts with people. 
Uh, if you, you, know, you can't just say we're going to model these behaviors and then we're going to be a great company. I, I can remember, because I'm older than most of the people in this room, the book In Search of Excellence, right? Peters and, and Waterman, that basically said, okay, we're going to go out and look at all the successful companies and we're going to see what makes them successfully, successful and then we're going to give everybody that formula. And if you do this, you'll be successful. Well, it fails because there are a lot of companies that did that and failed anyway. That's the survivor bias. So it's very difficult to say, all right, we want to be innovative, so let's look at what all innovative companies do, and if we do that, we're going to be great. I think it does get down to a fundamental that in order, and I think, Doug, you said it when you were up there, you said 76% of people don't like going their jobs. Well, you'll never have an innovative uh, work culture or place or drive innovation if 76% of the people would rather be doing something else. And, and I'm serious. I mean, it fundamentally starts at a level where people are engaged and where people are coming with different views and people are motivated to make a difference and that there are clear objectives for success and then people will drive to that. And ultimately, that leads to uh, uh, patents and that leads to collaboration and it leads to all the things, but people have to be engaged and energized and be working in a culture that leads to those outcomes. So in my mind, starting at the top and saying these are the endpoints and if we could just model these things and get those, things will be great. I think that, that the literature is full of examples where that doesn't hold anymore because businesses are complex organisms and that's why we call them organizations. They're organic, they have people in them. And I think to pass and not have deep conversations about what culture, the relationship between culture and these success factors, I think misses the foundation. And so, I don't know if we're gonna get back to it, but you said it, and then we went on to IP I think culture is where you start the whole conversation around innovation, creation, and productivity when you're talking about businesses. Now, those can be supported by good policy, and they should, and policy should be to make it all easier, to like make it less burdensome, to let people benefit from, right? So I don't think government gets out of the way, but they certainly do plow the field. They plow the ground to take obstacles out so that people can see the success of those endeavors. So, you know, culture is an extremely important thing. And when we think about culture, we can think about, and I'll be finished in 30 seconds. Okay. One thing that I, and I've said it in other, in other venues, is that when, you know, when we talk about the issue of um, uh, diversity and inclusion, if you don't have diversity and inclusion, you don't have innovation, because you need many, many lenses and many, many ways of, of interpreting reality and processing data. So the first question becomes, are we going to be innovative? We, you have to ask the question, is my organization you know, uh, you know, welcoming people who are not like me, who have different views, and can we deal with different views in an organization? I could probably write a list of things, basic things that if you don't have, I would bet on outcomes of success, whether it's innovation or something else. But I really, and I'll stress it, it's not a soft topic. Culture is not a soft topic. And you really have to deal with those attributes of what you want to see in your organization, because that's going to be the building block, as Jeff said, to the kind of things you want. And, you know, and, and, and you know, kudos to GE if they're actually make, recognizing and changing and building that new culture that's going to give them that kind of agility and, and flexibility driving forward and becoming you know, you know, a, a company that's going to be based on, on, on these innovative products. Uh, Andrew, you looked like you were itching to come in just a little bit before. Yeah, so I was just going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, about the role of government in innovation that, uh, that Jeff and uh, Glennis were, were mentioning. And you know, we, we end up with this discussion around um, you know, R&D tax incentives and, and the like. But uh, I guess when I look at it, the, the best role that government can play in innovation is about establishing the environment that makes it easy to innovate. Um, you know, our, our tax policy, that's for, for government to work out. We're, I think industry is happy to participate in discussions around it. But what's really great is when government sets up the right environment. And I'd share a couple of two really good examples and, uh, and one not so good example. And uh, the, the first one is where uh, both are in Queensland. So we're working with a subsidiary of Boeing around the, the use of remote piloted uh, uh, aircraft. And uh, you know, the Boeing subsidiary could have chosen many places in the world to do this, but it chose Australia and it chose Queensland. And that's because CASA gives them the environment, which is very rare around the world, of where you can um, use remote uh, piloted vehicles outside of the line of sight. 
Um, and this gives us the opportunity to be a world leader in this technology. Now, we're using it so that uh, we can replace having people going out to, uh, to well sites. That, that improves the, uh, the productivity, improves safety because it gets people off, uh, off the road. It means that we interact uh, and, and impact less on landowners um, and, uh, and gives us a, a, a platform for introducing some fabulous new technology. But this only happens because CASA gives you, us the environment where you can do that sort of thing. So that's the first example. The second example is, um, and this goes to the strength of having bipartisan support for, um, for industry and industry development, where um, the Queensland government over both sides of politics has given a great playing field for the development of the uh, of the onshore gas industry, the coal seam gas industry. And they've done this over many years, uh, both parties being in power, and they brought some innovations to make that work. So and one of them was the introduction of the Gas Fields Commission, which is a, a group of people who help the industry work with landowners, work with government. Um, it was something that hadn't existed and, and, and a great invention. And I think it's also a great example of innovation isn't all just about technology. There's business model innovation and inventing different ways of people to, uh, can work together. Um, now, so they're two great examples where government's given a terrific playing field. And that second one is one that has created, at its peak, 40,000 jobs in regional Australia and now employs over 10,000 people. And there are not many things happening in Australia that are putting jobs back into regional Australia. Um, an example of, of where government's not necessarily giving the playing field to help with innovation is the way the, uh, the environmental improvement, approvals processes work and can get tied up through the legal system. And you see, I think this has um, been referred to as lawfare, and the, uh, the, when it comes to planning of new projects in some parts of Australia, you do wonder whether it's worth even trying. Um, because of the abilities to get just tied up through planning processes and just continual, uh, uh, continual legal action. It's another area that is quite, uh, uh, quite ready for, uh, for some innovation. Can I throw, the, uh, throw open now to an audience?